qualified the call. So you 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 have pleased me so much. So so just rejoice, says the Lord, for indeed uh, I have got a mighty plan and a mighty purpose for you, saith the Lord. And uh, uh, the the time has come, says the Lord. Many many churches would uh, uh, come and uh, they would be waiting on me, but not this church, says the Lord. I I I can trust you, and I'm waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. It's time to go, says the Lord. It's time to go, says the Lord. It's time to go, says the Lord. For indeed, uh, there's many are waiting at the other side of your obedience to me. The healed and the bro- the hurting and the broken and the damaged, it- it's time to go. Have I ever restricted your life, saith the Lord? Have I limited you in any way? Have I put a stop sign in, in-, in your way? No, I've told you to go. And you say, well, yeah, I'm, I've, I've got a limp. We'll go with that limp, says the Lord. Yeah, but I've been broken. Go with the brokenness. And as you go, you will be healed. Oh, yeah, but I've got a past. We'll go with the past. For indeed, uh, as I said, I, I, I don't call the qualified. I've qualified the called and I've called you afresh. And I'm not asking you to go in your name anyway, says the Lord. I'm not asking you to go in your ability. I'm not asking you to go in your uh, capacity. Uh, in fact, I've given you the fullness of who I am. And uh, as I said, I'm so pleased that uh, uh, you're not waiting on me. But now I, I, yeah, uh, I'm waiting on you and, and you have decided to go. For as you go, says the Lord, as you go to the hurting and the broken, you will use my name, my spirit, my word, my power and my love and that is unlimited will you go tonight will you will you take opportunities this week for indeed i haven't given you a spirit of fear that fire that bricky was talking about that's the fire that will burn all the fear out of you for indeed let the spirit of boldness come upon you and go says the lord for there's not one sickness that i I, that i am not greater of there is not one demon that uh, that uh, can stand against me. There's not one stronghold that I haven't defeated. There's not one sin that, that I cannot overcome. So go, says the Lord, for indeed the harvest is ripe, but the laborers are plenty in this church. And as you go in my name, you will see, says the Lord, that all things are possible to those that believe. Well, our hearts are fresh. That, not very loud, is it? I just wanted to... I've got a cousin in hospital <clears throat> over here at Victor and she's somewhat um, given up. Um, she has severe diabetes. Um, um, that rejection has plagued her all her life. Frustration, anger, loneliness. She was abandoned by her husband many, many years ago. I'd just like to lift her up. So, Father, I just want to thank you for Rhonda. Father, I ask you to bless her tonight. Lord, we have faith to believe that you can touch her right where she is right now in, in the hospital bed. Father, right now, I just bind all rejection on her, all disappointment, all hurts. I just thank you, Lord, you would, you would loose your Holy Spirit, your balm of, of Gilead, Lord, to come down upon her. And bring healing to her, Lord. Healing. We command diabetes to get out of her in Jesus' name. And we thank you, Lord, that you could raise her up. We pray for her salvation, Father God. We loose your angels to her right now in Jesus' name. And we thank you that they would watch over her. And watch your word that they would perform that word, Father God. Your word never returns void, but it always accomplishes what it's been sent out to do. And we expect, Lord, a change in her in the name of Jesus this night. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Amen. Good evening, everybody. I'm Pauline. For those people who don't know me, there's a few... (laughs) Thanks, Bricky. That second to last song we sang about the goodness of God. You know, God is so good all the time. We can always depend on his goodness. (laughs) 
say, do I die? He's holding a cake at the door for those who didn't see. <laughs> Bless you, Bricky. <laughs> right. He is a good God. And I want to talk tonight on biblical hope. Raph was preaching oh, two or three weeks ago and he said one sentence that really hit me. He said, we all need hope. We have to hang on to hope. And I thought, oh, you're right, but what is hope? And it sent me searching through the word to find out what it was. Then I was talking someone, with somebody else the other day about hope, about worldly hope and biblical hope. And that person said, aren't they the same? And I said, no, they're not. But it made me think, you know, we really need to know what biblical hope is. So when I talk about hope tonight, I'm talking about hope in the Bible, not hope that's in the world. Worldly hope is just wishing. It may or it may not happen, but there's no certainty in it. Like at the beginning of the football season, I really hoped that the Crows would make the final. No certainty in it, and obviously they didn't make it. But with biblical hope, that's different. Biblical hope is a confident expectation and a desire for something good from God. And it doesn't disappoint. It's a happy anticipation of coming good from God. So if you can remember that tonight, hope, a happy anticipation of coming good from God. It's not only a desire for something good for the future, but it's a confident expectation that it will happen. It's not a wishing, it's that confident expectation, it will happen. Because hope is based on the character of God. And his promises. All his promises are yes and amen. What he says he means and he won't change his mind. James chapter 1 and verse 17 says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. The Passion Translation says it's never subject to change. God's dependable. God is good. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 23 tells us, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Again, that word hope means a joyful and a confident expectation to anticipate with pleasure. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith and hope go together. We have to have hope before we can have faith. If we take out hope, faith loses its description of how it works. The Passion Translation says, faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long or hope for. It's all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. So how does hope work? Let's have a look at Abraham for a moment. In Romans chapter 4 and verse 18, it says, Abraham, who contrary to hope, in hope believed, so that he became the father of many nations according to what was spoken, so shall your descendants be. So Abraham, contrary to hope, the circumstances were against him becoming a father. God had promised that he would become a father of many nations. And to do that, he had to start with one son. But he wasn't a dad. He was old 
and Sarah was barren. But in hope he believed, that verse tells us, in hope he believed. He didn't look at the circumstances. He didn't look at his age or his wife's barrenness. Verse 19 says, And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body already dead since he was about 100 years old and the deadness of Sarah's womb. So what did he do if he didn't look at that? Verse 20, he didn't waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strengthened in faith. He fastened his eyes on the promise of God. Was it his physical eyes? No, it was the eyes of his spirit. God had spoken it, that's what he fastened his eyes on. And verse 21 tells us he was fully convinced that what God had promised, he was also able to perform. God had told him he would be the father of many nations. That's what he chose to believe, despite the circumstances. He was fully convinced. He was happily anticipating and expecting coming good from God, which in his case was a son. The promise of Abraham being a father of many nations didn't depend on him, it depended on God. God had said it. Abraham trusted what God had said. Wherever there's full assurance of hope, there's faith. Abraham had a full assurance of faith. Hope is never based on what is possible with man. It always looks to the promise of God the expectation of good things from God because God is a good God. Hope is 100% sure. It's not visible yet to these physical eyes or present, but it's certain to take place. In the Old Testament, the word for hope means something just a little bit different and I just want to look at a couple of scriptures Jeremiah 29 verse 11, we probably all know really well. God's speaking and he says, For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a hope and a, a future. That word hope means expectation, the things hoped for. It also means to wait upon but it also means a cord as an attachment. So it's kind of like you've got the thing that you're hoping for and your hope is attaching it to God like a cord. And as long as you keep in hope, it's not going to be broken. When these words were spoken in Jeremiah, Israel was in exile for their disobedience. A false prophet had told Israel that God would deliver them from Babylon in two years' time. But Jeremiah came along to set the record straight and he told them that they'd spend the next 70 years in Babylon, which wasn't what they wanted to hear. This would mean that an entire generation would die before they were ever delivered from Babylon. But God spoke these words because he wanted them to know that he still had a plan for disobedient Israel. He has not and he will not forget them. And as the 70 years drag on, they were going to need, on, need to hold on to the hope that God wasn't finished with them yet. They needed this hope, this expectation of deliverance to get them through that 70 years. In Psalm 71 verse 5, David said, For you are my hope, O God. You are my trust from my youth. Now you can picture David tying a cord between himself and God. And he wasn't letting go of God. God was the one he longed for. That's what hope does. Joshua in chapter 2, verses 17 and 18 and 21, it's a story about the two Israelite spies were spying out the land. They came to Rahab and she hid them. 
And they said to her, if you tie this scarlet cord around your window and put all your family inside your house, you will be saved. We won't destroy you when we come for the city. That word for cord is hope. So that scarlet cord was a visible picture for her of her hope of deliverance. The scarlet cord was before her eyes and before the eyes of her family, reminding her that God would deliver them. So what about the New Testament? Romans chapter 8, verse 24 and 25 says, We were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Hope is for things that we don't yet see with our physical eyes. Once we see it, there's no reason to hope because it's materialised, we have it. Hope means we're looking at something we can't yet see. How do we do that? By using our imaginations, our godly imaginations, by looking with the eyes of our heart. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3 says, You, God, will keep him, us, in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. That word mind means creative imagination or inner image. So the Lord will keep us in perfect peace when our imaginations are stayed or fixed on him through his word, his promises to us. Our imagination is our ability to see with our hearts what we can't see with our physical eyes. We use it all the time. If I said the word apple, what do you see? You can answer me. What do you see? Do you see the word, oh, an apple, yes. Do you see the, the letters A-P-P-L-E? No, you see a picture of an apple. See. That's just an example, but we are using our imaginations. We are seeing things all the time. So we can use our godly imaginations to see the promises of God. When what God has told us becomes a vision or an image on the inside of us, then we wait for it with perseverance. People who quit and give up have a negative imagination they're seeing in their hearts the negative side of something. They don't have hope. We choose what we use our imaginations for. Proverbs 23, 7a says, For as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Clark Taylor had a saying. He used to say, What the mind can conceive, that's hope, what your imagination can see, and the heart can believe, that's faith, we can achieve. That's God fulfilling his word. Just say it again. What the mind can conceive, the heart can believe, we can achieve. We need to let God's word dominate us so that we fix our imaginations and our hearts on what he says. Hope is powerful. Faith and hope are linked. We already looked at Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance about we, what we don't yet see. Hope is the optimism built around our expectations and the things that we're longing for. Hope is vital, but faith makes us strive to attain what we're expecting. Not in the sense of working to earn it, but by maintaining our creative imagination, by meditating on the word and by trusting God. Because hope depends on God and his promises, not on any external circumstances. 
Faith gives substance to hope. Hope, I already said, it's the inner image, the imagination, or it's like a blueprint. Now a house, for those of you who are building a house, you would have had a blueprint for a house. Blueprints are the exact, detailed, scaled drawings of the plans of a building. They've got many more details than just a floor plan. In the same way, we develop our faith by building in our heart images of what God says. And we can put so much detail into the images of God's promise. Hope is the blueprint of faith. Faith has to have hope to work. Hope has to have faith to produce. Hope gives us the picture of what God wants through the word. Then faith takes that picture and goes after it. Hope always sees. It sees in our hearts, in our imaginations, long before our natural eyes, our physical eyes see it. It's always working. Hope knows what God has promised and it expects it with eager anticipation and with confidence. How do we keep hope alive? I'm sure that there have been stories of people who've had hope and it's kind of died because God took a while for the promise to actually be fulfilled. And we're human, we let go of that hope. But how can we keep hope alive? It comes when we begin to see ourselves with what God has promised instead of seeing ourselves without it. Bricky shared yesterday, I think it was yesterday, seems like a lifetime ago, on our spiritual identity. We are who God says we are. We just need to get a picture of it and believe it and live in it and walk in it. Psalm 33 verse 20 says, The Lord alone is our hope and we trust in him with all our hearts. So we put our hope in the Lord. How do we keep hope alive? Build some dreams. And dream big because we have a big God. You know, I've been in meetings here where some of you have had prophetic words. Take those prophetic words. Dream about them. Imagine them. See them coming to pass. We've all got a call on our lives. Seek God for what that call is if you don't already know. And then see that call. See yourself touching many, many lives for the kingdom of God. Don't limit yourself to where you are now. But see yourself in those promises of God. See yourself operating in the call of God for his kingdom. Failures and disappointments can make it difficult to dream, but God doesn't ever give up. So we shouldn't either. We can ask God to breathe fresh life on our dreams and he will do that. And it's kind of like we get the kickstart to get up and go again, to go after our dreams. Now, specifically, how do we use hope? Are you facing an impossible financial situation? The world is increasingly so at the moment. But the word says, the promise in the word says that God supplies all of our needs according to our incomes. Just checking if you're awake. <laughs> no, the word of God says God supplies all of our needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So get a picture of you paying off your debts. See you having money left over to give into the kingdom of God. Imagine you and your spouse going out and having the thickest, juiciest steak you've ever seen without even looking at the price on the menu. You just want steak. All right? See that if you have a financial need, get your imagination working taking your circumstances, but working with the promises of God 
because financial situations aren't going to change if we don't apply the word of God. People who are sick, right? Pretty easy to imagine the sickness. But God's word says we are already healed, 1 Peter 2.24. So we need to use our godly imaginations to see us healed already. If there's something we can't do or something we have pain doing or find difficulty doing, we can use that to create our imaginations and see ourselves doing it, see ourselves totally healed and live in the reality of your imaginations until faith comes and God shows up and we have our miracle. But if we just sit and say, oh, I'm sick, I'm sick, I have to go to the doctor, I have to pop a pill, and that's all we live in, we won't see the healing of God. We've got to live in the promises of God. Be careful who we share our hope with because we want people who stand alongside of us, who will build us up, who will encourage us, not people who are going to pull us down and say, oh, you're silly. So just watch who you share your hope with. And no matter how long it takes, don't quit. Abraham waited 25 years to see the promise of God be fulfilled. If it takes you 25 years, it doesn't matter. Because in that time, God is still working. God's building character in us. He's building us so that we can carry the anointing of God, so that we can do what it is he wants us to do. And if we did it straight away, we'd blow up or we'd destroy other people. But he has a plan and he knows what he's doing. We need to trust him, but work with him. Use our imagination. You know, Abraham, every time he looked at the stars in the sky... He saw the faces of his descendants. Every time he looked at the sand in the desert, and there would have been plenty of sand, he saw the faces of his descendants. He didn't give up. He tried to give God a helping hand and got an Ishmael, but he still held on to that promise of God because God said Ishmael's not it. He's not the child of promise. Do you know, every time Abraham introduced himself, He said, hi, I'm Abraham. He was declaring, hi, I'm the father of many nations. He was speaking it over himself as well as using his imagination. Do you have unsaved family? John 3.16, I'm sure we all know it. God is willing that none should perish. See your family members worshipping God. See them praying. See them reading the word. See them in church. If they have a particular strength, see them using that strength for the kingdom of God. They might be brilliant musicians. See them using that gift, worshipping in church, worshipping out in the park, worshipping God. See them. Use your creative imagination. That's building hope. Then faith will come and then God will show up because God loves faith. He can't respond to unbelief. Hebrews chapter 6 tells us that hope is an anchor to the soul. What God says he means. He's confirmed his word by his promises and by his oath, and that removes all doubt and uncertainty. The word will be fulfilled. God will do what he's promised to do because he can't lie. So we can have hope, and that hope is an anchor for our souls. When our emotions want to go off in a 100 different directions, and they will, We don't let go of the promises of God. Just because God doesn't work in our time frame, hang on to the promises of God. The inner images that we are eagerly anticipating from God, hang on to them. They can hold us anchored to the promise. 
An anchor is only as secure as to that to which it is fastened. So if we are fastened to God, if we are fastened to his word, that's a strong anchor. That's going to hold us. Okay, a couple of examples. I'm nearly done. A couple examples of hope in action. In Acts chapter 3, when Peter and John went to the temple and healed the man at the gate beautiful, that crippled man had been sitting there by the gate begging. I reckon his head was probably down and his eyes were on the ground. But Peter and John walked by and said, look at us. That man lifted up his head and looked at them because he was expecting to receive something. That hope, that happy anticipation of coming good rose up in him. Now, he was expecting money, but he ended up with leaks. His expectancy hooked into Peter and John's expectancy. For Peter and John, it hadn't been long since Jesus had risen from the dead. It was only a few days since Jesus had told his disciples, you go into all the world, use my name to cast out devils, lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. That's in Mark 16. I can imagine Peter saying, hey John, you know that crippled beggar down by the temple? Let's go and use the name of Jesus on him. They could see themselves doing what Jesus said they could do. Their hope, their happy anticipation of coming good was high. I can imagine that they actually yanked him up off the ground because they were so full of anticipation. I reckon they probably yanked him up off the ground. He had no choice but to walk. Hope saw the man healed. Now that's just my creative imagination looking at the story. But hope will keep us intensely focused on God's promises. It keeps that promise on the inside of our hearts when we can't yet see it with our natural eyes. We need to get to the point where we expect God to move so that all the distractions that come along won't even tempt us to look at them. All the past failures will become insignificant because we're so absorbed with the expectation of what God is about to do. Matthew chapter 9, verses 20 and 22 says, And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for 12 years came from behind and touched the hem of Jesus' garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that hour. Two key words in that verse. She said. She said to herself, If I can touch the hem of his garment, not even his garment, but just the hem of his garment, she used her creative imagination to see herself touching that hem of her garment. And the Passion Translation doesn't just say she said, it says she kept on saying, if I can touch the hem of his garment, I'll be healed. She'd heard about Jesus. She'd heard that he'd healed people and she was desperate. She pictured herself close enough to touch the hem of his garment that was hope. When she got close, she reached out and touched it. That was faith. And of course, we all know she was healed. Jesus responded. What are the benefits of hope? Hope gives us joy, gives us peace, gives us strength, endurance, gives us courage, Hope is the answer to despair. Hope sees the goodness of God that's coming even when others can't see it. Hope encourages us to endure trials and hardships because something good is coming from God. Hope expects God to answer. 
Hope is patient, expectant. It's a source of stability and it's purifying. So biblical hope is based on the promises and the faithfulness of God. It anticipates joyfully what God is about to do. It trusts God even when circumstances are difficult. Biblical hope is the happy anticipation of the coming goodness of God. So I would encourage you tonight, tomorrow, go home, lock on to the promise of God for your situation. Raph talks about that book, Scripture Keys. If you've got that, look up what your situation is and lock on to the promise of God. See it in your creative imagination. Speak it out to people, if you're around people, to people who will back you, not people who will pull you down. But speak it out. Spend time actually seeing that promise coming to pass. See it in your imagination. What would it look like if you're healthy? What would it sound like if you were healthy? What would it feel like if you were healthy? Watch your faith rise. Hope will see that imagination is so real, it becomes so real to you that when the actual miracle comes, it's kind of like you've already been living in the reality of the miracle. So hope is the happy anticipation of the coming goodness of God. Ricky and Evelina, can you come out, please? Okay, Phil. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. For those of you who don't know, Bricky and Evelina are leaving on their way tomorrow to go up to Uluru, where Indigenous leaders and people are gathering to pray for our nation. So as a church, I would just love it if we can just stretch out our hands and if we can pray for Bricky and Evelina, pray that they'll have a fantastic time, but that God will accomplish the mission that he's sending them to do. God's plans, God's purposes will be accomplished not only in their lives, but in this nation of Australia. This uh, Uluru assignment has been very, very strong in our hearts. Certainly it's got my attention for this nation. I believe it's pivotal in the spiritual well-being of our nation and the direction we must go, which is to God. Isaiah 26.2 Open the gates that the righteous nation which keeps the truth may enter Amen. in. Open the gates, Bricky and Evelina. Oh, good on you. <laughs> Let's stand up and just hold your hands towards them. I ask you not to lay hands on them, but just hold, stay where you are and hold your hands towards them. These are prayerful people. And in the name of Jesus, we just bring them before you, Father God, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for this nation, this great south land of the Holy Spirit, we, we send forth with our prayers and our faith for Evelina and Bricky to join with the, the gathering of the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people at Uluru, which means pebble. And Father, there's going to be a pebble in the, in the waters of humanity over Australia. There's going to be ripples that are going to keep going and growing in this nation. I saw the, yesterday the pillar of fire and also the cloud of glory over this nation, growing from places like Uluru and other places, and they join together. This is a divine destiny. This is a foreordained time and season for our nation. We send you forth not just, you know it's not just a trip, it's a divine assignment. It's an assignment for which God has been preparing you since a little boy. It's one of those type of things, Bricky. And God has prepared you well, both of you, and you're going together in strength. One of you puts a thousand to fly, flight, but two of you, ten thousand to flight. Open up the gates! Open up the gates! Open up the gates of this great Southland! Open up the gates! 
that the Lord may come in and rule and reign his kingdom and his will be done. In Jesus' name. We all say amen, amen, and amen. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Do you want to say anything? Praise God. That's your sister. Um, praise God. That's it. Okay. Well, that's it, folks. Great worship today. Thanks again. Uh, <laughs> British revenge is coming. <laughs> <laughs>